ways to teach a song. Um, we're still dwelling on number four there on the little whiteboard. So we take 15 minutes of time to work in How would you, uh, I would encourage you to have your children memorize their music. Uh, lots of reasons for that. One of the best being that when they memorize it, they Second, they can watch you if they're not old. Kids are just little adults and adults are just big kids. Their faces will be right in music, just like your dog bar. You know, they can be right there. So get them out of music and get them uh, to grow them in the same time. Now, uh, what are some interesting ways to teach children or to help children memorize a piece of music? What are some of the tricks you use? Anything? Yeah, find some more sections where the words are the same and the music is the same pointed out to you. This gets into form, and we're going to talk about that later. Too. Sometimes. A picture, right, something that we'll call a whole thought. A whole line is about rows. Yes, right, exactly. That's just one word that will help get triggered out of those words. I think this goal, and I use um, sign language. Sign language, cool. That would be fun. Did you have your hand? Did you say memorizing? Yes. Uh, the little game that my kids enjoy is when I'll take a section, like maybe a verse, and I'll do it up on the board, and then um, they'll sing it or speak it if you're just, you know, and then you take away five words, you know, erase them, right. and then they do it again, and then you take back three more, or however you want to do it. That is one of the best ways, I, and I tell you what happens, that's one of the things, best things to use right toward the end when you're getting ready to perform something, and something part of it is still not quite memorized. Because <clears throat> you might have two verses of something memorized, and the third verse is in quiet, ready to go, and this is your last verse. All right? So, what happens? You put the words to the verse on the board. Okay? Have them do like she said. Have them sing it or say it through once. Okay? Take away three or four words. And it starts to be fun. It starts to be a challenge. You know, they get all excited. You go up and erase another couple of words. You can hear it audibly. You know? Then they sing it back. And you go up there and you erase another word or two. And first thing you know, you've got A and the is to, and that's all that's left. And they're singing all the words. Right. How many times did they just sing it? Six, seven? Did it seem like a dream? No. But it was. And that's the only way that you can memorize sometimes is to drill it. And that's the best way to drill it. Because it feels like a game. Anything that can be fun, I mean, it, teaching something doesn't have to be <coughs> drudgery. I mean, you know, just make it fun. If you can make a game out of something, I'm all for it. You know, a lot of people think games don't belong in the classroom. Really, 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 really. I disagree. Mm -hmm. Because I think if they're teaching games, they're great. Another fun way is I'll say the first word, they say the next word, then I say. Yes. And then switch, and they have to say the first word, cool. then I say the next word. All of them. Yeah, play off of each other. Mm -hmm. Very good idea. Um, yeah. One more fun game. This uh, I'll do sometimes like the. Uh, we used to try to have a little party or something after we sing. Mm -hmm. And um, you know the little game, Steal the Bacon, where you put something in the middle and you give mm -hmm. numbers to the people on either side and you go and get it. You know that? I don't know it. Find that Steal the Bacon? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love. Several people do. Anyway, instead of giving the numbers on each side, you give the, you come up, like you got eight people on each side, come up with, uh, take eight of the words out of your song, and then you sing it and leave out the missing word, and then you've got the two people on the opposite side coming together and give it. And at first, the, the game is so much fun anyway, but then you use it as a way to work with music. Good. Yeah, any, any way you can teach with a fun game is going to be worthwhile. Because they can join it and they can learn it. You've accomplished two things. We just, we just um, elaborated a little bit on that and made tic-tac-toe on the board. If I had a class of two to do teams, mm -hmm. and by the time that I thought that they had all the words down, I would say one, we have one up there, and then we say, okay, next word, and then whichever team answered was the X or O, mm -hmm. and then have them. They love that. Yeah, that's a great way. And a play off what you were saying a minute ago with the one word here, one word there, is give us the first word of the phrase. See if they can do the whole phrase. God, Christ, and see if they can follow up, because most of the time they can. They can finish the phrase if they have the first word. And so these are just tricks uh, that uh, you know will help uh, your children learn without feeling pressure. Uh, and that's the whole point. You don't, you know, life is too full of pressure.
okay, let's don't pressurize our kids. Uh, let's make it fun for them, but let's teach them how to accomplish and achieve and enjoy it. I mean, that's that's more important, I think, than anything else we can do for them is to to help them realize that they can enjoy learning and they can enjoy doing things that are productive and have a good time with it. And uh, so that is really, that falls in our favor to make sure that that happens. Okay? So, we spend time teaching the, the uh, anthem. <coughs> now, <coughs> after we do that, we're ready for number five. Now, I said something a while ago about hymns. Um, I really urge everybody to take some time and teach hymns to the choir. Even if you just have that 30 minutes Sunday morning rehearsal, take some time and learn the hymn. Maybe it's a hymn you'll uh, have them sing in church and sit in But I tell you what, if we don't teach the hymns, who's going to? I use that as part of the routine for the closing prayer. Good. We sing the doxology of you know the season. If it's for Advent, you know we usually do a different doxology. So we, I teach that cool. to the to kids during that time. Great. Yeah. Um, schools can't do this anymore. You know, I learned standing on the promises in the first grade. <laughs> Can we do that anymore? I don't think so. Not at least not in the public schools. So if it, it's up to us. I mean, we're the only ones who can keep the hymn tradition alive. And we need to do that. There are all kinds of ways to do that. Uh, there are, you've got your own hymnal. You've got your whatever hymnal you use. Uh, but there are hymn studies that Courses Guild used to publish. I'll tell you, I say used to because you can still get it. Okay? Uh, Austin Loveless, many of you may know that name. I uh, was a church musician, hymnologist. Uh, composer, wonderful, wonderful man, died at the age of 90 about a year or two ago, but he did a series of hymn studies about this thick, actually about 40 of them, for Chorister's Guild. And what they consist of is on one page is the hymn, and on the flip side is information about them on Charles Level. And so these are, uh, you can call Chorister's Guild or, or go online and look these up. And what I actually uh, called to see if they were still available. She said, yeah. She said, I'm going to sell them to you for a nickel apiece. Well, that was half what they used to cost. They're not Austin Lovelace. Austin Lovelace. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, it's just a hymn study series that he did for Courses mm -hmm. And if you look at those, you can come up with some of your own. They're not that hard. I mean, look at what he did and how he kind of delves into certain aspects of the piece or the music or the text or the composer or the author or whatever. Some of the things he does with, with his. And then you can sort of see how that's done. Also, if you're a member of the course of Guild, <coughs> their, um, uh, the course, the magazine that they put out, has a hymn study every time it comes out. Complete with, uh, you know, how to take it apart in three or four weeks. Okay? So it's really a very valuable thing. I mean, the, the, to belong to the course of Guild and to get that magazine is worth it for, for that, uh, among other things. But, uh, there are all kinds of ways to teach hymns, and I'll tell you something. Um, the kids, they're not going to poo-poo this, okay? This, they're going to have their favorite hymns when the year's over. They're going to have the ones they like the best. And it's always, I have a page in my, in my notebook that says my favorite hymn was. And, you know, they have a chance to listen to one. But uh, they, they know good things when they hear them. You know, they really do. Kids have more taste than people realize. And that's why I think dumbing down to them or teaching them fun songs, that's okay on one level. But, you know, to let that be your music, uh, you know, there's other things that they're capable of learning that they will enjoy and appreciate. Uh, my youth choir loves to sing these Joy Band Society. They love Bach. They love that piece. Uh, you know, they, they uh, have a pretty little four-part choir. And they, uh, you know, they, they enjoy the, the fun music that we do, some of the fun things that we do. But they love the classics. And uh, it's all in just, uh, you know, exposing them to what's good. So, you know, the hymns are, are definitely things that we've got to keep alive with uh, the children because that's we're the only ones who can give it to them. So, uh, yes, ma'am. Not today, but um, Celebrating Grace. The, the yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the supplemental resources, there are many hymn studies uh, that you can purchase cool. through uh, the supplemental resources. And they have puzzles and games mm -hmm. and... Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's a wonderful new handle that came out what two years ago? A year ago? Um, yeah. Okay. There, there's one back. I'll have to say, fifteen dollars is not a lot for 
No, it is so much it's better recent. than the ninety one. Okay. And it's got <laughs> it's got kind of old and new, doesn't it? I was doing the Fellowship of American Baptist Musicians. Well, I don't know the Episcopalian. I, I think Baptists are starting to like me. I'm not sure why. <laughs> but I was doing Fellowship of American Baptist Musicians last summer, and they brought that, and they they uh, had a night where they sang through it. I mean, they had somebody actually up there, you know, going through and, and uh, leading certain hymns and talking about them. And it's a very nice book. But yeah, uh, these the supplemental puzzles. Uh, word puzzles, make a puzzle, make a, a, a hidden word puzzle for your kids. My kids love those. Every time we have a hymn study, I have put together a, 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 a hidden word puzzle. And you go online and get that done. You know, you go online, just type in hidden word puzzles, Google that, and it'll take you to all kinds of places that will create them for you. You give them words, some of them will even create them on whatever level. You tell them you want it for first and second graders or whatever, and they'll, they'll construct it. So, But uh, some of them will take the words you give them. And they'll construct them. So, I mean, you don't have to, but I kind of like putting it together. So it's just kind of fun. So, but again, uh, those are done with crucial words that, that are in the hymn, and of course, they're just extra reinforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is an idea I heard, I think it was here several years ago, and last year was my first year for choir coordinator at our church. And so, this is our, our hymn of the month calendar. Oh, Which each week I have a different hymn that they're supposed to learn. Yeah. And what I did was I incorporated it's got the, the hymn that month, and then it's got all the music in oh, it. Oh, how you give to the kids? Yeah. I, I, Look I, at I, that. Yeah, it's got the hymn that the month calendar. That is so cool. Yeah, that is a really cool idea. I heard that idea years ago. This is the first time I, I have, had actually <coughs> heard it in my choir. I've never heard of that. that. I may do that. Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should be very proud, yeah. Now yeah. yeah, take it everywhere you go. Put out the street corner, sure. I had issues, though, when I chose the hymns last year, but I made sure I found all hymns that were in common domain so that I didn't have copyright. Exactly. Which, that, that, that like, enters into you. Right. I know that, that couldn't mm -hmm. Sometimes there, there, there's a copyright license or something you can purchase through your church, or your church can do it. CCLI. Yeah, CCLI. That's what it is. And then you can, you can, uh, your, uh, as long as you give acknowledgments, you can, you can download or, or print anything for uh, educational and worship purposes that you want. Mm -hmm. And that's very useful. Very yeah. Helpful. Um, but yeah, this is a that's a wonderful idea, and uh, yeah. some of the kids can take it. Okay, so teaching hymns, and I'm also going to be doing a session later in the week uh, on uh, teaching hymns to children, ways to do it, this, that, and the other. So we'll get into that more later on. Let's move on with our things here, unless anybody has a comment or a question. Uh, we move to number six then, and uh, I told you about the notebook, or I mentioned the notebook that I put together for my kids. Um, it's got several things in it. First of all, it has a little title page, it's just computer generated. Right here in the middle, the reason it's blank is because uh, we have some little a note paper with an etching of the church on the front. I take that and put it in here uh, so that it's, uh, you know, I see in the junior part, St. John's Episcopal Church has got the church here. And so that's what goes there. The second page is the Courser's Prayer that I was telling you about, just done on a piece of, uh, I think it was a page of uh, a photocopiable, uh, just, I don't know what you call it, flyer art, I think. But it's just a little picture. And then uh, uh, did that little, put the little posture song in here. That, we didn't do this posture song. Either. Shoulders back and head down high. We didn't do that. Yeah, we, we, do that for we, yeah, we did that for us. We did the rap. Yeah, we did the rap. This is a song. This is something else. Yeah, I'll share that with you later. Uh, but there are other pages in here. What I always make sure that I have are hymn studies. Here's one that also was did on Praise the Lord, the Almighty. It's got the information on the front that for the kids on a kid's level, and then on the back it's got the hymn. And so these are very useful. They really are. The one thing that is a bit outdated is that every one of them has an amen on the end of it. Most don't do that anymore. Okay? The kids are like, what's that? Does. Huh? Any two Episcopal hymnal does, though, I bet. Nope. nope. Does <laughs> the only amen in the Episcopal hymnal is on uh, um, the one we sang today. We know that. Uh, or, or the, uh, yeah. within our music, yeah, there, there was another text to it, but it ends with an amen <laughs> in our book, and it's the only one that does. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But it's really bizarre. I mean, that's that's one of those pendulum swinging kind of things, because I remember the, 
disciple him when years ago had an amen after every single thing, <laughs> except angels we heard online. <laughs> and there's no amen. And one Sunday morning I was playing that. I was in high orchestra for my church when I was in high school. We were singing it on a Sunday morning. We got to the end, and I let up, and one of the bases of the choir sang, Ah! Uh, <laughs> only one who did. <laughs> Pavlov's dogs. I mean, it's the end of the game. <laughs> and bless his heart, he's, he just came right out. But it's the only him. That, and now it's just the other way. All, all the audience have been taken out. And I'm not sure of the reasoning behind it all. I don't quite understand. I have a feeling that one of these days the prayer hymns are going to contain audience. And maybe they'll find the, the, the balance that they're sort of halfway looking for, you know. <laughs> but anyway, here's a little more puzzle I created for that particular hymn to follow the hymn in the book. So, uh, you know, there's all kinds of things. We did the, here's one of his on Holy, 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 Austin Lovelaces, with the hymn on the back, and then a hidden word puzzle. And so the little notebooks are things that you can create for your kids. And these, this will help you get your year in order because, it, you know, I had these in the first person, which means I have to have selected hymns. Okay. Ahead. Yeah. Do you have that ready for the whole year before you start? And you have the whole book to it. Wow. That is sort of an ongoing project the year before. You know, don't take the month of July <laughs> and do that. You can, actually, you you could probably get a very good uh, indication of what you're going to need. You could jot down ideas and actually get some things on paper. But as far as getting everything together, you know, it, it, it helps to have a little bit of time uh, to, to do that. But, uh, uh, and then, uh, pardon me? Can I bring those to rehearsal? We keep them at rehearsal. Oh, okay. They won't come back again. That's right. So they, they go home. Yeah, they go home at the end of the year. They always say, "Can we take these home?" I said, "We have here." Again, I didn't say no. Did I? They said, "Can we take them home?" No. No. At the end of the year, at the end of the year, it's just fine. Um, there is. I don't have one in this book, but there are pages. Horses Guild has one that is a mosaic cross that you, the kids, can, it's a, you put it in the front of the book and it's a way of keeping attendance. Each week they'll color in a space and you know, with different colors and at the end of the year they got a cross, it's got all this color. I created one, being an organist, I created one with organ pipes mm -hmm. and numbered each pot. And so they come in each week and they color in the one we're supposed to color in for that day. And it's just a little way of them keeping their attendance uh, a record of their <coughs> when they come. And that's a nice little page to have. Uh, there was one I did one year that was a set of three stained glass windows with just little uh, spaces in them. And, you know, just some way for them to come in with a color uh, uh, crayon and, and uh, keep a record of, of their attendance. And they enjoy doing that. That's one of the first things they did when they get there, is to color in the space. Which one is it today? What's the number for today? Well, what was the last one? Oh, yeah! <laughs> okay, so anyway. All right, we finished. We talked about the season of Lent, okay, we, uh, I think I was getting to that, I don't think somehow we got sidetracked, but uh, uh, we spent a little time talking about the season because if they don't understand the season, the, the purpose of their music really is not, or their hymn, or their, uh, you know, worship at all, is really not uh, uh, going to have as much uh, uh, emphasis as, as it will if you actually teach why the, we're doing the music we're doing. So take a little time to talk about the season, explain the reason for having the color purple. Talk about uh, uh, the length of the season, uh, what happened during those 40 days. Uh, that is a wonderful time to bring, go down to the nursery, talk to the nursery person, and borrow a rocking chair. Bring it in the choir room, sit there in the front, and have story time. Sit in the rocker and rock back and forth, and tell them the story of Jesus in the wilderness. It's a wonderful story. And if you tell it right, and your attention, just like I've got yours right now. But you tell it with the kind of energy that goes with storytelling, that makes it so effective. And they will love the story. And they remember, I'll tell you what, they'll remember that story of, of the three temptations. They'll remember that for a long time. And lots of things can be done that way. You can have story time anytime you want to talk about something, a text that you're teaching. Okay? Um, any good teacher, my wife is a kindergarten teacher, and she knows this as, as well as anybody. Any good teacher will have a hundred ways of communicating the same thing. 
Because the more ways you can say something, the more it's going to stick. And so, uh, you know, lots of ways to teach, and the more things you come up with, the more creative you can be, the better. Uh, all right, so we move on to number seven. We've uh, talked about Lent, but now we're leading toward Easter. We've got to get an anthem ready for Easter. So we actually start working on one, even though it's Lent. That's kind of confusing to me sometimes. Why are we singing Hallelujah? I thought you said we couldn't sing Hallelujah during Lent. Well, this is an Easter piece, and that's just in church. See, we can sing it in here. Oh! So, you know, we. Uh, but uh, we might uh, spend a little bit of time uh, starting on the next piece. Uh, as you begin to teach a piece, don't, dwell, don't uh, delve into too many parts of it, the first rehearsal. Uh, in your first rehearsal, you don't have to do much more than get the melody in their ears. Okay? Have them uh, learn the melody, kind of play it back and forth. You might sing with it or have somebody sing it for you. Then have them do it on loop. And then, like somebody was mentioning a minute ago, if there are other places in the piece, maybe the thing comes back as a chorus or a refrain. Show them where in the music that they'll see it again. And say, see, you've not just learned this once, you've learned this page, and you've learned this page. Again, very positive. You know, they, they, you did it. You learned this. You actually did this. And they go away, you know, with a feeling of success. And that is so, so critical. They've got to feel good about what they're doing. And you can make them do that without any trouble. You really can't. It doesn't take much. Just it's, it's good, good reinforcement. Okay, we spent quite a bit of time seeing and studying. Time to relax a little bit. Now we're not going to stop learning, but we're not going to talk about learning. We're talking to talk about playing the memory game. And here I call it lint memory for a reason. Okay? How many of you know what memory is? Okay. Hold on, like playing concentration. Yeah, the old the old uh, TV show concentration where you. Uh, find something behind the square, and then you try to find the match, the same thing somewhere else. Okay, that's what the envelopes are. Okay, now, if I were doing this with my choir, there would be 20 of those. before be four rows of five. Because uh, the more complicated, uh, the more fun you can have, and, and the more you can get around to everybody. But for our purposes, we're going to just use this today. Now, we're going to actually play a little bit. Okay? Now, what has to happen? You find a match. You find one word in the envelope. You find where it's matched. That's just fine. You've got a match. But then you have to tell them what the significance of the word is. See what I'm saying? You'll see how it works. Okay, let's start down here. Not everybody's going to get to do this. So we don't have a. But yeah, pick two numbers for me. I'll pick. I'll, well, I'll be bad at white. Two and eight. Two and eight. Okay. See, that's a good way to start. You don't know what's where, so you may as well just pick two. Okay. That, can you all see? Mm -hmm. Fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Eight says prayer. Okay? Not a match. Point is try to remember where they are. Alright? Over here. Eleven and six. Okay, why don't you pick one first and see if it matches one of the others? Okay. Okay, eleven? Let's eleven. see what's in eleven. Forty days. Now we do six if you want. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move on. Nine. Okay, nine says. Prayer. Prayer. Oh, of course, we're two and eight. Eight. <laughs> Rare. She got a match. Okay. Now. Tell us what prayer has to do with Lent. You want me to do that? You. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you feel. Um, how about we, um, during the time when Jesus was, um, the, the days prior up to, leading up to Jesus' crucifixion. Right. And we could talk about the prayer in the garden uh -huh. when he was tempted, how he prayed. And that's yeah, how like, that's what he went into the wilderness for. Okay. Now, be sure you have taught Lent before you play this game. They won't know the significance sure. of the words if you have got you. So, use this game to reinforce some of your teaching. Not to try to teach with it, but to, you know, you've already taught something. So now we're going to show them another way to get it in here. Mm -hmm. Okay? Again, it's another way of, of getting the same thing out there. All right, so yeah, we talked about we talked about the fact that Jesus was in the wilderness forty days praying, etc. So that's where that will come up, and they will they will give that back to you. 
All right, let's move on. Okay, five stairs. That's a long one, that. Pretzel. <laughs> One says Lent. Okay. I'll talk about pretzel in a minute. Go ahead. Nine. Oh, there's nothing in nine. Oh, I. <laughs> it's all right. It's hard to see the board. I'm sorry, it's so far away. Uh, four. Four says 40 days. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 sure. 
think about it, you're going blow it. <laughs> what does fasting have to do? It's what Jesus did in the world. Yeah. Hmm. It's one of the things he did. He fasted and prayed. Again, it's imperative that this all be discussed ahead of time. Because doing it this way is not teaching. It's getting the stuff to them, but by the, if they're playing this game, they're not going to remember these things like they're going to remember it if you've already talked about it and then you see it in another form. So, now, let's look at something else. How else could you use this game? What else could you teach with this game? Uh -huh. Well, you can kind of extend it and let the kids like, get with the partner and come up with their own picture or... Sure, have the kids create. Yeah, that would be a cool thing. What else? Music symbols. Music symbols, I'm sure. What else? Musical terms. Musical terms. What else can you teach? Again, these are all things you're going to have talked to them about first before you play the game. Bible verses You can do you can certainly do Bible verses. You can match the prayers with the verse. Uh -huh. You could also teach, uh, you could teach uh, critical or important words in your camera. Mm -hmm. What else could you teach? I was just going to say, with that one, you could do words out of a couple of members. They should do words out there. But listen, if they get the pair, they have to give the phrase and the mm -hmm. song letters. Right. Yeah, don't stop with just getting the memory. Have them uh, reflect on what they found. Mm -hmm. That's part of the process. Okay? What else um, could you teach with this? Well, you go, you go one day and teach a scale. You could teach a scale notes. Mm -hmm. Sure good. How about your, uh, these, uh, like, cooperation words? Okay, yeah. Reflect on some of the words you've used uh, and uh, re review those. That would be a wonderful. See, I like this kind of thing because somebody will come up with something I've never thought of. I've never thought of teaching, of reviewing your, your uh, words for the day or devotional words. That would be a great way to use it. What else? What would be a great thing to do the first day of choir? Their names. Their names. Better yet, if you have a picture. Yeah, if you have a picture. That's right. That would be so cool. But the thing is, if you do have a name up there and somebody gets a match, then that person has to identify themselves. And so that you're starting to get in. That's just a fun way to get to know each other. Okay? What else can you do? Let's, let's brainstorm a little bit because we haven't covered them. There's a lot we haven't talked about that you can do. What else could you actually teach? How about the church calendar? Like How about the seasons, seasons of the year? Why not? Sure. <clears throat> what else? You could do rhythms. Yeah, you could do rhythm patterns. But then when they get the mass, when they, they get the mass, they have to do it. Do the rhythm. Yes, uh -huh. yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, you get the idea. This is a very useful game. It doesn't have to be just, you know, a certain way. You can actually use this game to teach any number of different things. And it's a wonderful game. They love to play it. And again, this comes into routine plus variety. Because it's the same game, but it's a different topic each time. And so if you can do that, then uh, you change the uh, uh, emphasis and it makes it uh, fun for them in a different way. They're learning something else besides just what they learned before, so they could, or they enjoy uh, that. All right, so let's go on then. We're just about coming to the end of rehearsal. We have a closing prayer. You can either use the prayer that you're starting with, if you had one you sang, or if you had one that uh, maybe somebody prayed, or that you, if you prayed together, you just sing one. It doesn't matter. But uh, in, open in, uh, in your rehearsal with the prayer. Okay, you're in a church. You're working with kids there, and part of what we do in the church is prayer. And I think it's good that the children learn, you know, what we're part of what we're doing is reinforcing what's going on in Christian education. Uh, we are trying to teach through our music the same things that they're trying to teach in Christian education. And that's where music has a very strong place because many of you can think of something you learned in the way of music growing up, a favorite text or a favorite Bible story set to music, and you'll never forget it. It will not go away. I'm curious, and I just would like to ask if a lot of people have. Sure. We have discovered, not all, but many of the children that come to our children's choirs do not come to Sunday school. And so I told my director, 
That may be your own practice. You are very right about that. That is one of those weird things. Um, not every kid that comes to Sunday school is going to be in the choir, but not every kid that comes to choir is going to be in Sunday school. Either. And that's a reality of the days. It's just a, a, a sign of the times. And so, yes, I think the more we can you know, do for our kids, the more we're going to give them something they may not get anywhere else. And we're reinforcing what the church is trying to teach anyway by, um, you know, reflecting on the seasons and the year and the, the uh, different uh, aspects of the life of Christ and all that sort of thing. So uh, it's very important that we uh, remember that this is, we're not just teaching fun songs or just, you know, I had an interesting conversation with a mother years ago. I will not call her name. I will not ever refer to her <clears throat> in any other form except to say that she called me one day and she said, my daughter is so tired of singing hymns in choir. I said, oh, really? She said, yeah. I said, what's the point? <laughs> and I said, well, I said, the point is uh, we're a church, and uh, these are things that they can't learn in school. And she said, well, I grew up, I, I never learned to sing a hymn when I was in choir, and I think I turned out all right. I don't think so, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> that was in the back of my mind. I sure bit my tongue. Yeah. I mean, yeah. What was funny was the girl, I, I know, who, you know, her daughter, she's a wonderful little singer. And she loved to sing. But I think that was the problem, that we were spending so much time on learning about the hymns and not, not seeing it as much. When I figured that out, uh, and got that together in my mind, I started doing a little bit more of the hymn of singing it each week while we talk about it. But it took me a while to think about that because I don't think the kid was having a problem. I think the mother was having a uh, The daughter said something about, you know, I just don't enjoy the hymns that much. And what she was trying to say was, I want to sing them. I don't want to, you know, hear so much about them. I want to do them. And so I thought, well, if we can mix those and get more of the singing in there. And I did. And I never saw her, you know, uh, react in a, uh, in a negative way to do the hymns in the first again. But it was her mother, I'm not sure her mother understood what she was complaining about. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I did at first. But the more I thought about it, the more like there's something here that we need to address. I kept trying to figure it out. Because she loved to sing. And I knew that she did. And I couldn't imagine that she wouldn't want to sing him. But the problem was, I think we were just talking too much. You know, that's one thing to think about in your rehearsals. How much talking are you doing and how much singing are you doing? You know, and have a balance. You know, talking is good, especially if they're doing some of it. But singing is what they're there for. Yeah. And so that is that is important. Uh, we have a little time left. I want to turn the page. It's on the back of this page. And let's cover the basis a little bit. Let's uh, look at some ideas and see if you are using these or how you could use them if you aren't. Okay? In your rehearsal, is your choir having an opportunity to listen? What are ways they could do that? What could they listen to? They listen to you singing. Say again? They listen to you or mm -hmm. each other singing. They could listen to me or, or, or another child singing. What, what else could they do? Listen to the recordings of the music that they're making. Listen to the recording of some of the things they're doing. A lot of the publishing companies put out demo <laughs> CDs of music they publish. And so if you get some of these, you may have an automatic built-in recording of a piece you want to teach. Right there, done by a very good children's choir and good supervision. It's a wonderful thing. What else can they 